Hello and welcome to the Bad Movie Beatdown Countdown of the Best and Worst Films of 2016. Yes, it's a little bit belated for reasons that I'll get to in a moment, but it's finally here. The list of what films shine brightest on our screens last year and the ones that stunk them up. I've seen over 130 films released in 2016, which is up for my total last year. Well, I should hope so, given the amount of time it's taken me to get this video out. I typically delay my year-end retrospectives because many of the awards contenders haven't been released in the UK by the end of December, which would leave a rather glaring hole in my selections. These last few weeks, however, I had more personal reasons in that I had a family bereavement, and I took a break from making videos. This has meant that I've not seen a number of those awards contender films because when you're dealing with grief, the last thing you really want to do is spend two hours watching Manchester by the Sea or movies with heavy subject matter. Needless to say, I haven't seen everything and there were some noble movies that escaped me, or because I'm probably not going to rush out and watch some obviously bad things like Nine Lives right away. This is purely how things stand at the end of the year. Ish. Just to give a quick reminder of eligibility, the film has to have been first released to a paying audience in 2016. So movies that premiered at festivals the previous year but weren't formally released until 2016 count, whereas films from 2015 that opened in the UK the following year do not. Because of the amount of time it has taken for this video to come out, this won't be my usual look back at the film world in 2016, because that would be far too time consuming. And to be honest, I really don't want to look back at a year where we lost a number of talented and respected artists, and all the stupid shit in between. <laughs> So you have to accept my apologies for that. I think what we all need right now is a bit of catharsis, and with that in mind, let's fire some passing shots at some of the cinematic lowlights of last year, of which there was plenty to choose from. But first, some dishonorable discharges for this lot. Dirty Grandpa. The first 2016 film I saw featured in its earliest moments Zac Efron walking in on Academy Award winner Robert De Niro vigorously masturbating to porn, which is a sight I spent the remaining part of the year trying to bleach from my mind. Managing to make little fuckers look classy by comparison, the man once revered as one of our greatest living actors now goes around as a horny widower that exclaims, I want to fuck, fuck, fuck! He also spews homophobia, drops the n-word, and repeatedly sticks his thumb up Efron's ass before going all mawkish about how he's going to die someday for some cheap sentimentality and later thrusting his willy in his grandson's face. Director Dan Mazur is so lazy that he even recycles the same slideshow joke from his earlier I Give It A Year, while Efron has to grimace through his manhood being challenged because he drives a pink car. But then again, what do you expect from a movie that's so clever its dirty grandpa is actually a dick? Hardy ha ha. Seriously though, why does he have the same name as the guy who made Donnie Darko? I am right. Whatever happened to John Travolta? Donning a long black leather trench coat that fails to hide his midsection and an obvious wig, he looked alarmingly like Steven Seagal in this umpteenth variation on Death Wish, where his wife, Rebecca De Mornay, gets ice just after the opening credits are done and he vows to get those responsible. Did I mention he was ex-Special Forces? Because of course he is. Travolta then goes around shooting people in the head with terrible CGI blood and uncovers a conspiracy that's obvious right from the outset because the film's that cack-handed and obvious. It's hard to believe that Chuck Russell, who once made movies like The Mask and Eraser, is the one responsible for a net dross such as this that manages to do cliché badly. I am wooden more like. London has fallen. In the 2012 war between the two White House action thrillers, Olympus Has Fallen and White House Down, it was the mean-spirited underlit Olympus that won, so Gerard Butler and Aaron Eckhart are put through their paces again in London. Well, actually, it's Bulgaria, which is somewhat ironic given that Millennium Films' fellow flick criminals moved to London purely to take advantage of the tax breaks. And London Has Fallen looks just as ugly and unconvincing as the same locations do in a Steven Seagal director video outing. The film also brings back the entire cast for Olympus for no reason and only has no direct reference to the earlier film, which makes it feel like a weird retread come remake. Mostly it's just strikingly hateful, like when Gerald Butler yells, Get back to fuck Hedistan, and acts like Jack Bauer's thuggish, stab happy cousin. When London elected a Muslim mayor later in the year, racists started using the title until it started trending on Twitter, which shows just how odious this film really is. Suicide Squad 
Honestly, it was a coin toss between this and Batman v Superman to represent the DC Cinematic Universe on this list. Both are fascinating train wrecks, but in markedly different ways. But at least Zack Snyder's three-hour dirge had a misguided sense of vision, where a Suicide Squad feels like a botched attempt at damage control that was endlessly recut and stuck together, because it was by a trailer house. Squad features some of the worst editing in a major studio release in some time, trying to desperately correct the dark tone long after filming, but nothing would have saved writer-director David Ayer's script that is filled with plot holes and bad logic to the point where the entire second act is pointless. Everything about it feels try-hard, like Jared Leto's overhyped extended cameo is the worst rendition of the Joker on screen to date, to the endlessly on-the-nose soundtrack picks to delude itself into thinking it's Guardians of the Galaxy. Let's not forget Carl Irvine's Enchantress cavorting around like a drunken hula dancer, or a team assembled to take down someone like Superman that has the powerless Harley Quinn in it, so Air can spend half the film pointing his camera at Margot Robbie's ass. It's like watching an explosion at Hot Topic. Zoolander 2. Sequels a decade later are always tough, especially those to comedies. Zoolander 2, a mere 15 years after its predecessor, is completely unnecessary and feels it in its every frame. The problem is that the central gag is just as old, as star and director Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson reprise their roles as vapid models, and drenching them in prune juice does nothing to change that. In fact, they totally regress as characters because that's what happens when you brutally crush their love interests. Stiller makes a fatal miscalculation. The original was a movie about models that just happened to have an assassination plot, whereas the sequel is a spy movie that just happens to have models in it, and the film has the bombast of an action film without being amusing. As they trot out all the same jokes, it's clear what little satire there is is utterly toothless because of the avalanche of cameos in virtually every scene. As it progresses with its bizarre fountain of youth plot involving a blood sacrifice, it feels like the movie is completely falling apart by its climax, and this is one of those sequels that's so awful that it makes you wonder if the original was really that funny in the first place. And now, my picks for the 10 worst movies of 2016. Andron. Hey, remember when Italian filmmakers with pseudonyms like Vincent Dawn used to do blatant rip-offs of popular films that had names like Strike Commando? Well, it turns out they still do that in Italy, because the spirit of Bruno Mattei can be felt in Andron, a lawsuit inviting mashup of The Hunger Games and The Maze Runner. It's even got slumming American stars as well. It's not a surprise to see Danny Glover in something as low-rent as this, but it's startling to see Alec Baldwin as the architect of the Redemption Games, yes, that's really what it's called, in the mold of Wes Bent in Philip Seymour Hoffman, who was intercut with the action at random intervals and clearly shot his scenes separate from the rest of the cast. He's watching over ten contestants in his maze that looks suspiciously like a barely lit warehouse who wake up with amnesia and have to fight to the death, and we don't care a jot because none of them even have a name until the closing credits. Utterly incomprehensible, the biggest year should be reserved for its abrupt stop that baits for a sequel, given how it was shelled for two years, not bloody likely. Cabin Fever. Even in the endless churn of horror remakes, a redo of Eli Roth's 2003 indie hit only a decade and a half later seemed especially pointless, and it is. Roth's original film wasn't exactly a classic, but according to the filmmakers here it is, because this remake, produced by Roth for some reason, uses the exact same script with only some minor cosmetic changes, like altering party pop into a woman or reworking the death scene slightly. So we get the same story of idiotic partying friends who get infected with a flesh-eating disease, making the same stupid decisions and petty arguments they did in the last incarnation with a slightly darker, more cynical tone. Who exactly is this supposed to be aimed at? Is duping inattentive people skimming VOD services really that big of an audience? What few changes there are make it worse, including a mercy kill that gets sadistically botched in the new version, but if there was a crown for the most pointless film in 2016, this would easily take it. Sell. Stephen King's books have provided material for some great movies, and a whole lot of terrible ones. Guess which one this is? Despite the fact that King himself co-adapted one of his less regarded works, although apparently he lost control during production, this is easily one of the worst King films to date, almost serving as a companion piece to Maximum Overdrive. This latest techno terror sees a signal turn mobile phone users into rabid zombies, and 1408 stars John Cusack and Samuel L. Jackson re-teamed to help survive the apocalypse. Clips, which veers quickly from heavy-handed allegory to just plain goofy. Sat on the shelf for 
two years, this looks like it was barely completed, with plain font credits that look like placeholders and an atrociously green screen finale. There's plenty of unintentional laughs to be had here, especially from the embarrassing dialogue that compares the zombies' movements to flocks of birds, or the comically OTT violence. At one point, the zombies start making the infamous Trollolo song from their mouths, and you start to wonder if this is all an elaborate troll on the audience, given it's so bad it's close to becoming parody, especially by the time the underwhelming ending rolls round. Fifty Shades of Black how does one manage to miss a target as easy as Fifty Shades of Grey if you're Marlon Wayne's in a million different ways? Wayne's cast himself as Christian Black, a billionaire who built his empire on drugs, and despite his wealth, is not above stealing cars and purses, because that's apparently what a black version of Christian Grey would do. That's only the first of numerous stereotypes that are as offensive as they are lazy in this disgusting spoof movie that not only fails to satirise its source or its numerous problems, but often manages to be even worse. Kelly Hawk has to endure numerous scenes where Wayne's insults her over how ugly she is, her genital hygiene and more, to the point where you start feeling sorry for her for having to act in this. This is a film so scattershot that it lacks even the faintest internal continuity. Hawk's butt can't feel being struck in one protracted scene, but later it becomes an issue because that's what happened in the original, all for gags that wouldn't sustain a sketch, and even stoops to a comedy rapist character who disappears without being punished. At one point, Wayne's reads the E.L. James book and cries, Who wrote this? A third grader? Well, you know what they say about people in glass houses. Friend request. Why do horror films insist on using internet ghosts that are more silly than scary? Hot on the heels of Unfriended, to the point where this English language German production used the title Unfriend in that country, this swaps out Skype for Facebook and ditches the desktop gimmick for a traditional narrative of noisy jump scares. Alicia Debnam Carey stars as a student who tries to unfriend a witch who curses her in suicide to lose her friends, mostly by bumping off her besties and hijacking her page to post videos of their demises. And now it's a race against time to stop that friend count hitting zero! This may be a nightmare to social media addict tweens, but it's risible to everyone else, as it starts becoming a rip-off of The Ring, where each revelation makes less and less sense. This unintentionally funny horror was so bad it's yet to receive a US release at the time of this video, and the plot constantly reminds you you should have stayed home and watched Black Mirror on Netflix. Get a job! Filmed all the way back in 2012 and so hopelessly out of date that the recession it's overtly referencing has now passed, it's easy to see why this has sat on the shelf for so long. It's rubbish. Despite the efforts of an extraordinarily talented cast, many of whom went on to greater success after this, like Miles Teller, Anna Kendrick, Brian Cranston, Marsha Gay Harder, and Alison Brie, this comic take at trying to break into the workplace doesn't yield a single laugh. You can tell the people that wrote this are in their 40s and have no experience of their subject given they seem to sympathise most with Cranston as Teller's father, who has to do a gag about dyeing his beard that would be rejected on a sitcom. Teller wants to be a video maker, but when one of his creations goes viral, he doesn't get a single comment until it passes 100,000 views. Elsewhere, Nicholas Braun swears at and tells inappropriate stories to children, Kendrick gets addicted to pot, and Bradley T. Jackson has to chug deer semen as part of a workplace initiative because who hasn't done that? Fittingly, the director and writers haven't been in work since. The Brothers Grimsby Sasha Baron Cohen hits a desperate Nadir in this staggeringly unfunny action comedy that manages to fail at both genres, playing the uncouth long-lost brother of Mark Strong's spy who blows his cover and has to help him complete his mission. Sheared to the bone at 80 minutes and still manages to outstay its welcome by about 70, it's mostly just a lot of crude episodes stuck together with the thinnest pretext, including Cohen having to suck poison out of Strong's testicle, getting a beard of pubic hair stuck to his face, sticking rockets up his anus or celebrities getting infected with AIDS. Worst of all is a brutally extended set piece where Cohen and Strong hide inside an elephant's vagina and enjoy an elephant bukkake party where they must fend off giant thrusting penises that hose them down with semen, a sequence that made me seriously question what I'm doing with my life. Cohen's latest creation is a caricature of a caricature that's more annoying than he is amusing, and the constant attempts to shock are just depressing. In a year with far too many spy comedies, this is like Kingsman if it was directed by Keith Lemon. The Late Bloomer 
The true story of how entertainment journalist Ken Baker had a growth on his pituitary gland that meant he never experienced puberty until it was removed serves as the inspiration for this dire comedy. In the right hands this had the potential to be a sweet and humorous tale of sexual awakening, a twist on the 40 year old virgin mold. Instead it gets used for a high concept sex comedy with the mentality of a porky sequel. Johnny Simmons stars as the sex therapist who promotes abstinence, oh the irony, who undergoes a belated puberty including acne and horn dog urges that he can't control, but mostly turns into a gigantic asshole. Actor turned director Kevin Pollock can't even help a scene properly, let alone jokes, but worse is the movie's insistence that you're not a man unless you're constantly salivating over women and everyone should just do more shagging. How the hell the likes of Maria Bello, Jane Lynch and JK frigging Simmons got involved in this uncomfortably unfunny film is a mystery for the ages, especially given the script crams more uses of cock or penis in 25 minutes than most pawns across their entire running time. Norm of the North all together now, Rob Schneider is a polar bear! In the sort of animation that should only be used to punish awful children, Schneider's norm travels to New York to stop an evil property developer voiced by Ken Jeong, who plans to build luxury condos in Norm's polar home. Quite why anyone would want to move to freezing apartments that could fall into the sea and get potentially attacked by bears is anyone's guess. Congratulations movie, you've conceived a plot that underestimates the intelligence of six-year-olds. Even by kids movie standards, Norm of the North is the kind of cynical movie where you can feel yourself getting dumber with each passing second as you cringe through terrible jokes, lame dance sequences, a heavy handed environmental message, and worst of all, a bunch of indestructible constantly peeing lemmings straight from the minions mold. It's the kind of film where people are so stupid they can't tell a real bear from a guy in a costume because hey, it's for kids, who gives a crap, and the contempt shows in every frame. The Offering, aka The Fate of Anna Waters, aka Anna. You know a movie's great when it hides behind three different titles depending on where you see it. Two of those titles don't even make a lot of sense because the titular Anna Waters dies as the film begins and it's only tangentially related to the rest of the plot. Instead it focuses on Anna's sister who travels to Singapore after her passing where she discovers that a binary speaking demon is using the internet to make people with incurable illnesses sacrifice themselves to help make the Tower of Babel rise. Yes, that's really what this film's about. This Singapore production often feels like the the script was rare in English, translated into Malay, and then translated back into English again because it makes so little sense. Then again, I'm not sure there's any way to explain why the demon likes to possess a vintage diving suit on occasion. Then the film mutates into the sixth billionth exorcism movie for its finale with a possessed teenage girl that prior to this had literally acted like she was five years old, and that's only a taste of the bad acting here. This is so bonkers and daft that it verges on being so bad it's good, but most Mostly this is just plain abysmal. Right, now that we've got rid of the dirty laundry, we can finally look at some of the great films that came out in 2016, of which there was a fair few. This is a year of exciting, ambitious, topical, and just plain entertaining flicks, and here are some of my favourites. First, some great films that didn't quite make the list. 10 Cloverfield Lane. Arriving almost out of nowhere, its true identity as a Cloverfield spin-off was kept secret until a few months before release, this fittingly became one of the year's most pleasant surprises. A lot of its success comes from its minimalistic setup. Mary Elizabeth Winstead finds herself trapped in a doomsday bunker after a car crash by Apocalypse planner John Goodman, but is he really telling the truth about what's outside? Director Dan Trachenberg minds a great deal of tension out of its enclosed scenario keeping the audience guessing with its sharp editing and taut script, but it also works as a great character piece, giving plenty of time for the leads, including John Gallagher Jr.'s overlooked turn as the shelter's fellow inhabitant, to give terrific performances. Horror favourite Winstead makes for a resourceful heroine, but I'm not quite sure if I can look at Goodman in quite the same way again. The film's climax, where its connection to its predecessor becomes apparent, is a massive shift in gear after what came before, but it's entertaining on its own terms, and the change in scale does feel like a payoff after a largely very contained movie. If this is the standard Paramount's Cloverfield anthology intends to keep, I'm all for it. Captain America Civil War 
It was a year that pitted superheroes against each other, but in the battle between Batman v Superman and this, there's an easy victor. Managing to confront the issue of its hero's place in the world and the damage they cause along with it, the film presents no easy answers to their situation, but provides an intelligent backdrop for what this film is really building towards, which is to say the big battle royale that works like a giant sandbox, managing to give each member of its massive cast a moment to shine, seeing their powers play off each other, a sequence that's tremendous the enjoyable. But the Russo brothers, continuing their strong work from the Winter Soldier, manage to explore darker material while still delivering popcorn excitement, while also managing to subvert expectations like defying a city destroying climax in favour of an ultimately far more destructive personal battle. Even if Evans' straight arrow cap gets swallowed up slightly by his own movie, Robert Downey Jr. delivers his best performance as Tony Stark to date, played by bitterness and regret, while Daniel Brawl impresses the the mysterious villain, and Tom Holland's Spider-Man has a memorable introduction. Proof that superhero films can be smart and morally complex without having to be brooding or cynical. Florence Foster Jenkins I am, and I suspect many of my viewers are as well, a fan of So Bad They're Good movies and media, and for many music lovers, Jenkins was exactly that, an opera singer who notoriously couldn't sing. Perhaps that's why I was so engaged with Stephen Frears' biopic that explores its subject in a surprisingly moving way, approaching her story with the tragic comedy it deserves. In the title role, Meryl Streep glides between impersonating the singer's shrill tones in hysterical pieces of schadenfreude and the drama of the fact that she's unaware of just how bad she is and the poignant vulnerability of living with syphilis. But it's Hugh Grant as her husband who gives an unexpectedly great turn that's one of the best performances he's ever given, as he tries to allow Florence to live her ambitions while going to extreme lengths to protect her from harm, even as she pushes to become more and more public. Simon Helberg plays the pianist who befriends Jenkins once he manages to pick up his jaw, and this bittersweet farce manages to be sensitive enough to earn its laughs without mocking, even managing to draw a few tears in its final moments, so I guess it hit the right notes for me. Green Room a punk band's concert at a neo-Nazi bar turns into a brutal fight for survival in Jeremy Salnier's vicious and razor-sharp thriller. An almost harrowingly intense film, this twist on the assault on Precinct 13 mold, set largely in the titch of the green room they find themselves trapped inside, is unremitting in its tension, dispatching its cast in unsentimental, shocking fashion at a moment's notice. Oh, there will be blood, and lots of it, and spilled in disturbingly realistic ways including one particularly stomach-churning shot with a box cutter. The late Anton Yelchin, a brilliant talent who was cruelly taken from us not long after the film's release, is great as the band's bassist who finds himself massively out of his depth, but it's Patrick Stewart cast very much against type as the neo-Nazi's leader who chills with the unnervingly calm way he tries to control the situation that leaves a lasting impression. A white-knuckle, exhilarating ride that seldom lets up, it's certainly an excellent film with the anarchic spirit of punk running through it, but I think I might give it a while before I revisit it again. I was that perturbed by it. Consider yourself both warned and recommended. A United Kingdom the true story is Soretti Karma and Ruth Williams that led to the independence of Botswana, director Amar Asante reveals a story of how love and the power of the people can overturn even the might of the British Empire. David Oyelowo gives a superb performance as Karma and has great romantic chemistry with Rosamund Pike as his wife Williams, whose interracial marriage caused a major international stir that resulted in Karma being exiled from his own country, and this is a timely plea for tolerance and standing against racism and bigotry. Needless to say, segregation is a major theme in the story, not least because it plays against the backdrop of the emerging apartheid in South Africa. While it is a very political story, the romance makes it accessible, and Asante plays the material with a mainstream, crowd-pleasing approach, as indicated by Jack Davenport and Tom Felton as slimy, caricatured representatives of the Empire, and it's a rousing story that deserves to be heard, and represents a year when black histories and stories have really begun to move into focus on film. And now my picks for the cream of the crop. Arrival. 
A wonderful showcase for Amy Adams, Denny Villeneuve's sci-fi drama about first contact is involving from first frame to last. She and Jeremy Renner are a pair of professors who are sent to try and translate the language of the aliens that have recently landed across the globe, and the film does a great job of maintaining tension and intrigue with regards to how language works. This is a truly intelligent piece of work that manages to make linguistics not only accessible but fascinating, but also feels authentic to what this experience would be like and how disorientating it would be, where rationality is in a constant fight against the fear and hostility that breeds in their presence. But it's also a testament to the power of Villeneuve's direction, who is so aware of the power of his imagery and how cinematic the story he's telling is, that much of the film is Adams and Renner interpreting images in front of a silver screen like we are in a rather meta element. However, the beating heart of the movie is Adams, who is the emotional center that makes the extraordinary very human, as the best science fiction does. Hell or High Water? Chris Pine and Ben Foster are the Robin Hood style bank robbers in this Texas set thriller played against the backdrop of economic hardship. It's that which gives this movie its grounding and atmosphere, and with retiring police officer Jeff Bridges on their trail in his final chase and enjoying the thrill of the hunt, Hell or High Water is a modern western. But instead of the vibrant landscapes of the old wild west, these lands are home to forgotten ghost towns and harsh reminders of the economic disparity that drove Pine and Foster to commit their crimes. What makes the movie though is its emphasis on the characters, both the brotherly relationship between Pine and Foster or Bridges to his Native American partner, who share the affectionate jazz of two people who've worked alongside each other for a very long time. Even the small bit parts tell little stories, like the waitress who is a bit miffed that the generous tip from Pine is going to be taken as evidence, which is both amusing and a revealing detail. As the two sets of characters converge towards their inevitable confrontation, it has the feeling of something from the 1970s in a good way. The film's stormy, ambiguous final scene is an absolute corker. I, Daniel Blake. This latest draft from Ken Loach is one of his best films in years. Working once again with writer Paul Laverty, this story of a widower who has recently suffered a heart attack fighting to keep his benefits when a medical assessment incorrectly deems him fit for work is one that's all too familiar to many people in the UK, and you can feel Loach's rage at the inhumanity and injustice of the Kafkaesque rigmarole Daniel finds himself in in every scene. Developed in Loach's trademark improvisation that strives with documentary-like realism, the film feels authentic not simply because it's extensively researched, but because it feels so human and raw, managing to mix humour and tragedy in the way life does. Much of this comes down to Paul Johns in the title role, who normally works as a stand-up comedian in London, but also because of Hayley Squires as a relocated single mother that Daniel befriends and tries to help in one of the year's most heartbreaking performances. It's not just a great film, it's a relevant and important one as well. The Jungle Book. Disney's recent efforts of exploiting its brand by remaking its animated classics in live action is something I feel quite divided about. There are definitely times where it feels like cynical cash grabs that don't differ enough from the originals to truly justify their existence, but on the opposite side of that argument is The Jungle Book. John Favreau's reworking is a very different film to the original 60s cartoon that inspired it. Yes, it follows the same story beats and a few of the songs are included, but it makes an honest attempt to try to do something different with the material incorporating some of the darker elements from Ryan Kipling's book. It's also a stunning visual marvel with breathtaking CGI work featuring incredibly lifelike animals that are voiced by a starry supporting cast including Idris Elba, Ben Kingsley, Christopher Walken and a superbly chosen Bill Murray as Baloo. Some might wonder why make a live action version when so much of it is technically animated but seeing these photoreal creations interact with flesh and blood newcomer Neil Seti who does a remarkable job of carrying this movie, especially given his co-stars aren't real, really brings the story to life in a way we haven't seen before, even in other live-action versions. It's what you hope for out of these remakes, respectful but not beholden to its forebears. Kubo and the Two Strings The latest awe-inspiring animation from Laika, the studio behind Coraline and Paranorman, is their most mature and emotional work to date. The tale of one-eyed Kubo, who was forced to go on the wrong with Monkey, voiced by Charlize Theron and a Beatle warrior voiced by Matthew McConaughey, there's a pure visual poetry to the film and its stunning visuals, the result of painstaking stop-motion accentuated with CGI that renders it frequently eye-catching, especially in the thrilling swordplay 
play sequences with Monkey or when Kubo uses his magical musical abilities. But the script is equally soulful and sensitive as it explores heavy issues of family and grief in the course of high fantasy. Unlike Laika's work previously, it's not afraid to be truly dark and scary, most notably with a brilliantly creepy pair of twin sisters, both voiced by Rooney Mara, that pursue Kubo on his adventure and are unnerving even for older audiences and enough to give the younger ones nightmares. Maybe that unusual mixture of tones is why the movie sadly didn't find its audience during its theatrical run, but it deserves to be discovered and embraced so it can work its magic. La La Land Whiplash director Damien Chazelle makes a major departure from his last feature for this love letter to the Hollywood musical. The tale of two ambitious characters who fall in love, the film reteams Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone for the third time after Crazy Stupid Love and Gangster Squad, who once more have phenomenal chemistry together, and I genuinely think the film wouldn't have worked as well as it does without their charm in the lead roles. Like the movies this is paying tribute to, it's all about star power and charisma, and Gosling makes his potential essentially snobbish jazz pianist cool, while Stone has never been better than she is here. It manages to catch both sides of Los Angeles, with a first half that's more traditional musical capturing the glitz, glamour and allure of the showbiz world and the rush and joy of love, but the film becomes something far more complex and nuanced than pure prestige in its latter portion, as it focuses on the realities and hardships of making it and relationships. With some wonderful toe-tapping musical numbers, it's a welcome day of sun that I found hugely entertaining, romantic, and cinematic. The Nice Guys Writer-director Shane Black, after a brief diversion to the superhero genre with Iron Man 3, returns to the detective buddy movies he does best with this highly enjoyable trip to the 70s. Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling make for a brilliant double act and play off each other very well. Crowe is a thuggish bruiser that needs to feel wanted, and Gosling is the alcoholic private investigator that's a walking screw-up with moments of lucidity. Armed with one of 2016's funniest scripts with a quotable and snappy dialogue that's become Black's signature, this is a hell of a lot of fun, especially from Gosling, who showcases a real talent for great slapstick comic timing, be it trying to aim a gun with his trousers down, or falling down a hillside to impress a girl. Although the film is as cynical as you would expect from a hardball detective story, there's also an underlying sweetness to it, especially from Angori Rice as Gosling's savvy daughter who has to take care of her father's messes. It's a shame that we probably won't get another case with Crow and Gosling, but this is well worth investigating. Nocturnal Animals Tom Ford's thriller with three storylines nested like a Russian doll was the second of Amy Adams' impressive double bill last November. A complex, difficult, and provocative piece of work, this psychological tale of revenge would be engaging alone as simply the pulpy and violent novel within the film that makes up the main body of the narrative, but it's the framing device of Adams reading it and recalling the relationship between her and writer Jake Gyllenhaal that gives the movie its depth and nuance. It's both a film about writing and interpretation, but also of cruelty and malice, and how those shape and influence our lives and the way we see them. And fashion designer Ford definitely shoots with an impressively visual eye, and there's something Hitchcockian about how the subtle becomes sinister. There's also a host of great performances throughout, with Michael Shannon and Aaron Taylor Johnson's exaggerated, sun-scorched characters from the novel being especially memorable scene stealers, but this is an uncomfortable work, best of very cold. It also boasts the year's most distinctive title sequence, but I'm not sure if that's for the right reasons. The Witch the Witch was one of those movies that took me a while to really get my head around, because it's not the sort of movie you see every day, and it's one of the most unique horror films come out in recent years. While the story of a family being terrorised by supernatural forces is not a new one, the execution of it, focusing on historically accurate detail and rich in symbolism and allegory, feels so fresh and different that it defies what you traditionally define in the genre. Anya Taylor-Joy was an unknown at the start of the year, but she's probably one of 2016's defined stars, as she subsequently appeared in Morgan and Split, but her compelling lead role made a lasting impression and is one of the film's best features, although all the performances here are brilliant and immersive. A true gothic fairy tale with themes of religious examination as the family becomes consumed by sin and suspicion, the witch boasts some of the year's most striking and disturbing imagery with an ominous and unsettling atmosphere that makes it hard to shake off. 
don't go expecting your usual disposable horror film and it's all the better for it. Zootopia aka Zootropolis In a year of, to put it mildly, divisive politics, Zootopia or Zootropolis as it was renamed in the UK due to copyright reasons ended up being one of 2016's most relevant and timely films and only got more so as it progressed. For a Disney film aimed at a young audience, the fact that it confronts issues of prejudice including segregation, racism and sexism in a way that's appropriate and accessible for its target demographic is rather bold. Its cute visuals hide social satire with sharp teeth, but it rarely feels heavy-handed or obvious because its allegory is not a direct one-to-one, -one, imagining a society with an even more complexly layered hierarchy than our own, and the film's world is brilliantly realised in detail by the filmmakers and its stunning animation. But aside from those things, it's also one of the year's most consistently funny films, in large part because of the interplay between Jennifer Goodwin and Jason Bateman that carries the film. Sharply observed, with plenty of heart, Zootopia is, in my opinion, among the very best Disney films. So there you have it, my most liked and disliked films of 2016. 2017 is already shaping up to be a great year for cinema, and hopefully I'll be back here again doing my annual list in more timely fashion. Or at least before 2019, anyway. Until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, beating down bad movies everywhere and fading out.